Mises Seminar used to meet on Thursday evenings. And Mises would walk in precisely at 7.25 when the meeting started. Very proper, very trim, always dressed in a suit and vest and tie. You never saw him in informal attire. Maybe not never isn't quite right because in one of those books you'll see him without a vest. But he was always very proper, very prompt, and very much of the gentleman. And the seminar was not a very large seminar. <coughs> On Thursday evening, November 14, 1968, there was a huge affair going on at the NYU School, Graduate School of Business where Mises held his seminar. An overflow crowd for Friedman, Milton Friedman, and Walter Heller, the representative of the Keynesian School and the Monetarist School. And they were, were so many people came to attend this meeting that they had to have uh, microphones and have an overflow crowd in another room. And Mises was holding forth to his seminar of maybe 12 or 15 people that same evening. Mises didn't get a large group of people to these seminars, but he got some very important people. He got some of the regulars. Well, my husband and I went more than anybody else. But Israel Kersner, whose name you may have told, known, he came and he became assistant to Mises. Uh, Murray Rothbard used to come quite regularly for a few years until w we moved into a building with an elevator and Rothbard at that time had phobias and he couldn't get in elevators. <laughs> the Sennhouses came. So, and um, matter of fact, when I went to the foundation and man Percy persuaded me to come down to the Mises Seminar, we didn't meet at the Mises Seminar, uh, Mary, I persuaded Mary Homan then to come down with me. and. Once or twice we would be late and Mises would come and say, we can't start, the girls aren't here yet. <laughs> but we'd sit all around a great big table and Hazlitt also came quite regularly. At first he said he came mainly because he wanted to encourage Mises to let him know that with this small group there were still some people who were really interested in hearing what he had to say. But he later said that he came because he always got something out of the lecture, some new insight, some new understanding of history. And Mises had a way of talking about history that made it seem, well, it was always a different approach from what most people expected. Talked about the Industrial Revolution, about before the Industrial Revolution, when the countries were, most countries were agricultural and trade was very, well, very little foreign trade. Farmers were self-sufficient, and they had a, uh, practically no money, uh, bar no money economy at all. And the farmers, one of the biggest troubles was trying to find uh, the money they needed to buy salt, which was usually a government monopoly, and and to pay the taxes they had to. Gradually, trade came, and there was more trade. But this trade was not what you'd call big business trade today. There were little peddlers, little little traders who went around from one place to another, and uh, they were sometimes robbed and, and sometimes killed. It was not a very uh, safe business to be in. But they moved around and they be developed an idea that they could hire women at home to do spinning and weaving and they would take wool and yarn and go from house to house and deliver it and sort of a cottage industry developed. This was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. These women worked at home and the peddler came around with the yarn and so forth and so on. Then with new ideas, people began to invent machines and conceive of the idea of putting many spinning wheels in one room and having the women move and have the yarn there. And uh, so this began to have factories, it began to have factories. This was, of course, hundreds of years ago, but it was a small, small beginning. And the uh, then someone in England dreamed up the idea that maybe they could grow wool in Australia and import the wool and manufacture it in England. And this was the beginning of the wool industry in Australia, New Zealand too probably. But the, it was a long, slow process from very small beginnings. And one of the important things that had to be developed for business to become big was bookkeeping, accounting, and calculation, which came about with money. 
Now, Mises had every every semester we had a broad general subject like epistemology, capital theory, interest theory, Marxism, socialism, money and banking, intervention, economic calculation, competition, history and historiography. And Mises had a gift for saying things in quite an unexpected sort of way. He, of course, the basis of the Austrian school theory is, of course, that values, that men act and that values are subjective and everybody is always aiming at the thing they want most. And in economics, people begin to look on the goods and services that are produced as the economic action. But it's goods and services are physical things and the action is a mental thing. You don't, you, you, you can't understand or, or uh, you can't share, you don't have the same values as somebody else. Everybody has separate values. Values are subjective. And he said, just as there is no standard and no measurement of sexual love or friendship or sympathy, aesthetic enjoyment, so there is no measurement of the value of commodities. You can't measure subjective values. Prices are not anything that you can uh, grasp, that you can hang on to. They are ratios between goods and services and the money that exchange at a particular time and place. It's, it's an, an exchange ratio. And once a price is paid over for a good, that price no longer exists. He says the price is like a snowflake. You can see it, and it, but it, then as soon as you see it, it's gone. The next instant, it's, there's no price. You can't add these things up. A government can no more determine prices, seeing that prices are ratios that exist between the values of one person and the values of another. That's what a price is. And governments can't determine those any more than a goose can lay hen eggs. Um, I feel as though I've just been swept all the way down here from New York and my notes are just all over the place. And I, well, about government and education, I can just read you a lot of these quotes. A government, uh, government versus private education is a, it's a philosophical dispute whether or not you should have government education, political education, or whether or not you should have private education. It's something that depends on ethics and moral and religious, and it's not a political question. If the government teaches students more than the three hours, than the three hours, then the situation becomes uncomplicated. The government can teach students to read the sign, no smoking, or 45 miles, 55 miles per limit. But if it goes beyond teaching the three R's, it gets into history, political philosophy, religion, even literature, then there are problems with the governments being in the field of education. Government education is, in effect, government brainwashing. If you're in favor of brainwashing, then you're in favor of government schools. Uh, about, um, he says, the same government that says 17 million people go to bed in the United States hungry every night have spent billions to make food prices more expensive. He thinks that a good slogan, a good political slogan, would be a party that was in favor of cheap goods, making things cheaper. He says countries inflate in the war in order to deceive the people. People are willing to die for a cause, but they don't want to pay the prices in taxes. In 1904, Russia paid for the war with Japan by taxes, even though they were unpopular. 
because they preferred the criticism that they would get from their people for having to pay such high prices to the unpopularity at that time of going off the gold standard. By 1914, 10 years later, the opinion had changed and Russia inflated in World War I. He said that, uh, he, as I say, he gave insight into historical knowledge that you didn't think of. He said public works for relief, as were proposed in the New Deal and as proposed by Keynes to solve unemployment, was not new. They were doing the same thing in the 18th and 19th centuries. Keynes probably didn't know, but in the French Revolution of 1848, there were public workshops to employ people. And after a few weeks in 1848, the people became so much disillusioned with the project that the large majority of the parliament, even the socialists, wanted to abandon that program. And price controls, of course, as you probably have all heard, is, are not something new, but they were established 3,000 years ago by Hammurabi. In Austria, there was so much anti-business sentiment that in, um, and big business was even considered one with only 21 employees, and they were uh, attacking the uh, big business of that size. He's talking about advertising. The only thing advertised in the socialist system is the greatness of the dictator. In a free economy, advertising teaches us there are planes, baby foods, refrigerators. Advertising is very expensive, but I would say it is more effective in educating people than our high schools. Uh, people blame the liquor trust for the people or the liquor advertisers for the fact that people are drinking liquor. They blame the gun manufacturers for the people that, that, uh, that they buy guns. But he says, beginning with Omar Khayyam, wine has been advertised by the poets. Were the poets in the pay of the whiskey trust? Why not say that the desire for cleanliness is the result of the soap trust and its advertising? There is a distinction between an institution like an orphan asylum or a prison, which tries to feed the inmates what they like, and the restaurant, which loses customers to other restaurants if they don't like the food. If the cook in the institution burns the cake, the supervisor may say that the boys or men were bad and there won't be any dessert that day. And why should the members of Congress be so nasty that they fix a minimum wage lower than their own? They're talking, using that kind of language today, arguing for medical insurance all across the country that we ought at least have as good medical insurance as the, as the um, government, uh, Congress mess for itself. About um, uh, farm price supports, the French government buys and stores wine, just as this government buys and stores wheat and butter. But wines improve with age. The same cannot be said for wheat and butter. Most people get their economic ideas from plays and novels. Dickens' novel, Hard Times, had a tremendous influence. Through a nice little girl character, Dickens criticized the capitalist ideas of Bentham. Bernard Shaw, wrote economic tracts, but his great influence as a socialist came from his plays and novels. Bernard Shaw, Oscar Wilde were willing to sacrifice the truth if they could make a witty remark. Uh, I was reading, I think maybe in some of the other notes that I had from Mises today, that even people who don't read books, when they express opinions, they're expressing ideas that other people have expressed in books and that they've heard about by a third or fourth hand. Mises was not an anarchist, and he, we, there were several subjects that came up frequently in the seminar, and the students just couldn't understand what Mises was saying. One was on monopoly, one was on, on um, mathematical economics, statistics, and the use of statistics and economics. And um, uh, of course, the subject of government also came up, and intervention. One of his favorite remarks, one of his 
I think prize winning remarks, was about government intervention. Someone asked him once, you mean to say that if we had such and such a high unemployment and we had factories that were idle and so forth and so on, and people unemployed and people uh, just not able to eat, well, you think the government should do nothing? And Mises said, yes, but the government should start doing nothing much sooner. <laughs> <laughs> what he meant, of course, was that the unemployment and the hunger and the starvation and the factories being idled were the result of prior government policies. The government had uh, probably in, in almost every instant expanded the money, increased uh, subsidies to some people and not to others, had um, uh, granted extra credit so that businesses had expanded and there wasn't the demand for them and then by some maybe getting scared because they were worried about inflation coming along that they had to contract and then you have a realization of what had been done before. It was the government activity before that should have been stopped. And that's the trouble that Mises was always arguing about. People, bankers, oh another thing he said was uh, um, about being a banker in the 20th century, if you were smart, you wouldn't be. <laughs> but um, uh, when the government tries, if the government ever tries to contract the quantity of money or to get on the gold standard, to reduce the credit expansion, to just reduce the amount of credit expansion, there's so much opposition from the people who have been used to the expanded credit, the subsidies, and the things that the government has been doing that the tremendous political pressure is put on them and they just are, the bankers cannot resist that pressure and that is the reason and as a matter of fact that's one of the disputes between Mises and Hayek I think as to whether or not it's something in the system that causes the banks to expand or whether it's political pressure and uh, uh, but that's one of the minor fine points. Uh, well, so they couldn't understand what he had to say about monopoly with, and they couldn't understand what he had to say about mathematical and statistical economics. He said the averages and the statistics don't explain anything. He said, if you have a man standing with one foot in the fire and the other foot in an iceberg, the average is all right. <laughs> and this is what you lose the the important factors, which are the individual, the micro field, the a actions, the activities, the incidents, the, the micro activities, you lose when you start talking in macro terms, if you know what I mean. When you start, when you com make, combine statistics, use averages and aggregates, you, you've, you don't know what's going on that's lost in the, in the macro figure. He, uh, he said it's less harmful to tax losses than to tax profits because if you tax the man who makes profits, you're taking the greatest contributors, the people who make profits. What, a pro what the people who make profits are doing is taking goods and services that are undervalued on the market, considering their potential <coughs> uses, combining them, transforming them, and moving them around and turning them into something that the consumer is willing to pay a higher price for because he wants it more. So they're taking undervalued goods and turning it into something that's more valuable. That's what a profit is. And when they try to take away the profits, they are destroying the incentive and the production of the people who are the most capable, the most productive. He said, perhaps orangutans could talk if they wanted to, but they don't want to because they don't want to pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> he says, economic forecasters are like men who sell pills against earthquakes. When challenged as to their effectiveness, they replied, well, do you know anything better? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and he said about Marx's Das Kapital, it's good for insomnia. <laughs> <laughs> and Marxism came to this country only very late, he said, in installments. 
Marx didn't say the worst things. He had angles for that purpose. He said there are wholesale and retail soothsayers, those who presume to know the destiny of nations as opposed to those who presume to know the destiny of individuals. There's really no difference between these two classes of soothsayers because the destiny of a nation is the sum total of the destinies of all the individuals in the nation at any period of time. Marx was a wholesale soothsayer. He knew precisely what the end of human history was being. That was the coming of socialism. That knew that was inevitable. Well, he used to get into arguments with people about government. And there we had some anarchists, maybe we have some anarchists here tonight, I don't know. And he maintained that the government was necessary to prevent and to, to ensure social cooperation, to protect life and property so that people could trade, could exchange goods, and could live free, that you had to have that minimum government, a night watchman state. The night watchman was state was necessary so people could live their own lives. And people would try to press him and say, you should, the government shouldn't tax, we should have voluntary contributions. He says, then you'll start having wars. And when pre really pressed, he would say, go and write it in a book. He felt that writing it down in a book would help you to understand. Now, you, uh, you asked about Rothbard. He thought Rothbard was brilliant, and Rothbard is brilliant. He couldn't understand how a man as brilliant and as bright as Murray Rothbard could be an anarchist. He once asked my husband to debate Murray Rothbard on the subject of anarchy, but Anna, uh, Rothbard's a slippery debater. He doesn't debate. He name calls. He just wouldn't debate the issue. Are you folks Rothbardian fans? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, Rothbard's, uh, I, I wrote an article for the Senholz Festrich. Did any of you read that, Roger? Or anybody? I said that Rothbard was like a Dr. Jekyll and a Mr. Hyde. He's a Dr. Jekyll in that he's brilliant. He's a Mr. Hyde in that he's vicious and vitriolic at times. There are just two sides to him. He, he writes brilliant economics, and then he turns around and is just vitriolic. I enjoy reading him, but uh, so far I haven't been a butt of any of his criticism. I don't know what I'd say if he, I, I, I'm an insignificant sort of person. <laughs> I'm not important enough to attack. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he says, government can do things with bayonets, but the question is, what will be the consequences? And that's what, of course, government is. Government he, he is the policeman, he says, if you're polite, or the hangman, if you are not quite so polite, because government is the hangman. When government interferes, it is a new factor and it brings about definite effects. He says, you can't easily escape governments today, not even on the moon. <laughs> but, <laughs> the difference between a gang and the government is that the gang has only a short life and in a limited area. If its life is prolonged, you must say it is no longer a gang, it may become the government. And that, of course, has happened in many times. But he thinks that government is necessary. And if you don't have a government, you can't have social cooperation and you can't have uh, peaceful society. You can't have people trading with one another without their having to carry their own guns and then you start having warring factions. So he made it very clear that he was not an anarchist. Uh, he said there will always be a market for new production. When everybody has a TV set, this was in 1951 he was saying this, and I didn't have a TV set then. When everybody has a TV set, what will the industrialists produce? I don't know, but they will. Now, what have they done since then? Like, it's really amazing. We, we hoard silver. We have hideaways, we try to hedge against inflation, we try to do all kinds of things to guard against the big government and to keep our money uh, from ta being taxed completely away and everything else. And yet the entrepreneurs, the businessmen are so productive, so ingenious, so innovative, and so uh, clever 
that since 1951, when not everybody had a TV set, they have produced fax machines, microwaves, uh, what else can you think of? 101 things, and, and they're still doing it. The entrepreneurs are just remarkable. But they have to do this oftentimes with their hands tied behind them because they're being hampered. And now there are more and more schemes being proposed to hamper people still more. You have OSHA, you have EPA, you have, and who knows what kind of medical program we're going to have, have in the future. Oh, he says, bankers, and this is the quote about bankers that I mentioned, bankers in the 20th century don't think. If they did think, they wouldn't be bankers in the 20th century. <laughs> The study of history shows how easy it is to make mistakes. An intelligent forecast is based on the lack of intelligence on the part of those whose behavior is being forecast. Saints don't usually serve in the offices of foreign exchange controls, nor do they serve in the offices of government. <laughs> uh, if you look on deflation, the opposite of inflation. And of course now this is another thing. He had problems with definitions. Inflation to him was an increase in the quantity of money and credit. And most everybody today speaks of inflation as an increase in prices. But where did the increased money to pay the increased prices come from? If everybody's paying increased prices, there has to be more money coming from somewhere. Um, to a lot, and there's more money still being pumped out. Now uh, the much of this new money that's coming is going abroad. Chaffalin's gone. Who, uh, somebody else from abroad? But either many, many people overseas and abroad are hoarding dollars, and this is helping to keep prices down in this country. But um, the deflation is the opposite. Now, most governments don't want to deflate because that means taxing money and then burning it or destroying it or not using it. And governments don't like to tax in the first place. They'd much rather increase more the spending more with new dollars. But he says, if you look on deflation, which is a contraction of the quantity of money and credit, from the ethical point of view, you will assume that it is a cure for inflation. This is like saying that if a man has been hurt by being run over by an automobile, you can cure him by running the automobile backwards over him, <laughs> or by running over his other leg, or by running over a different man. <laughs> this is why Hazlitt used to come. Even when he was a, a, a mature man and had been writing and was writing for Newsweek every week. He came because Mises always had a different, some kind of a different insight, some, some different comment to make on what was going on. Now, when he was asked in class, what do you think about Lyndon Johnson? This is when Lyndon Johnson was president. Lyndon Johnson's proposal for this, that, or the other thing. He says, well, let's talk about ancient Greece or Rome because they had the same problem then. He didn't get into personalities. He did say once, and this was not actually in the seminar, but I heard him say that he thought the two most dangerous men in this country were Samuelson, the man whose textbook was used in hundreds of colleges, and Milton Friedman, beca because Friedman was considered a free marketer. And Friedman is, well, I don't know what to say. Friedman's an inflationist. He doesn't understand what prices are. And he thinks you can have a negative income tax and help the poor that way. That means, of course, handing money out to them, which is what they're doing in many ways. So uh, what he thought about the other person you mentioned here that I should talk about was Schumpeter. What did I do with my notes on Schumpeter? Well, I'll find them. He said, uh, uh, Prices, I, this is the quote I didn't have exactly right. Prices are like the snows of last winter. They come, but at the moment we catch them, they are already something of the past. Infant industry protection, this is on trade and, sub, and tariffs to protect the infant industries. 
Infant industry protection means development of the very industries for which the country does not have an aptitude. Import duties levied to make the standard of living higher leads to the protection of those items that are most expensive. I don't know how I keep running it across. I'll, well, Schumpeter was a contemporary of Mises, and Schumpeter very early went into more or less mathematical economics. And Schumpeter also believed and wrote books to say that calculation was possible under socialism. And he thought that the socialists would be able to plan their central government even better than the, uh, in, the, in the capitalist society. Schumpeter happened to be the head of a prominent bank in Germany, I think it was, when the 1923 inflation came out. Yet Schumpeter came to this country and got an important position at Harvard University. I think that, although Mises never said so, I think he was jealous and resentful of Schumpeter. Schumpeter got so much recognition. He said, that Schumpeter was susceptible to changes in fashions and economic fads. He went along with the times. That's probably why he got a position at Harvard. So um, uh, there was no particular love lost between the two men. I don't know that they saw each other after they left Vienna. I really don't know. But Schumpeter still gets a lot of recognition and is considered a, an advocate of capitalism, I think. Well, I thought I was going to have someone here in the audience who would be able to say I was wrong about some of these things. I figured nobody knew what I, what I know about Mises seminars. If Bill Peterson had been here, he might have been able to say I was not telling the truth. But I think I told the truth. <laughs> um, the seminars were not well attended. They were about um, half of the students that came there came because it was an easy grade. And the other half were ones who came and got hooked. And um, there were many who came and went. I came year after year after year. In the early years after the sessions were over, we used to go and have coffee, more or less a Viennese custom, uh, after the lecture. And we had coffee at Child's Restaurant not too far from there. And later years, well, they moved uptown because they tore down the building we were meeting in. And we, uh, so that sort of stopped that habit. Mrs. Mises used to invite the seminar people up for tea. And um, I'll be tell us a little story. I don't know how many, some, you, most of you are familiar with the foundation and with the, uh, uh, where I work. And you probably, many of you know Hans Senholz. Uh, as I told you, when I came to New York, I started going down to, uh, I was working at the, came to work to the foundation. I started going down to the seminar. And I got Mary Holman to go down with me. And um, Mary and uh, we went regularly, Mary and I. And one time, uh, Mrs. Mises had invited the whole seminar group up to tea. And Mrs. Mises is a, was an inveterate matchmaker. And um, she said to Mary one time, not very subtly, why aren't you married? Or why aren't you, or something like that. She says, well, all the men she met were married. And she says, well, Dr. Sennels isn't married. <laughs> Shortly after that, um, Mary got up and sat, went over and sat down and started talking to Hans. Well, <laughs> Uh, I also suspect that Mrs. Mises had something to do with asking. When Hans was working on the translation of Bombawik, which is a great big fat book, translating it from German to English, his English was not that good at that time. He knew the German and he recognized if the English was right, but he didn't know how to phrase it in proper English. So they said sh sh he needed an English editor. So Mrs. Or, or Dr. Mises recommended Mary as I say, I think Mrs. Mises may have had something to do with it. But anyway, they did work on that together and finally did get married. And they are married and both back at the foundation again after being away for many, many years. Uh, the, um, 
Um, so we, I know a number of people who came to Mises Seminar and they were registered at NYU and people asked them uh, about it and they said, well, they told us not to take this, you don't want to take that course, that isn't economics, that's religion. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so the, they discouraged, actively discouraged people from going to Mises Seminar and I would say there were fewer coming at the end, uh, most of the ones that came at the end were regulars who came irrespective. Mises, I don't know that he ever received any money from NYU as a teacher there. He was subsidized the whole time by either foundations, mostly the Volcker Foundation out in California, and then when the Volcker Foundation went out of existence, some businessmen took over, especially Mr. Lawrence Furtick, whom some of you may have heard of. He was a, an advertising man and also wrote a column for the um, New York World Telegram and Sun, which is no longer in existence. And there were some other wealthy men who put up Mises money, even paid for his office rent. And I suspect paid for Kersner as a uh, 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 teacher's assistant or whatever he was supposed to be, and a secretary. So Mises, in spite of the fact that his influence has been substantial and I suspect will be still more substantial in the future through people like you folks and other people who've studied and read his writings, never had a real job as a professor. He, uh, in, in Vienna, he worked in, as a, in the, um, well, I guess sort of as an economic advisor to their uh, parliament in what they call their chamber of commerce. It was. Uh, and that was his job. And all his writings were done on the side. He, uh, uh, you may have heard from Richard Ebeling, of course, about this, but he was in the office early in the morning, uh, gave the seminars and also lectured at the university as a private lecturer. He was not on the payroll at the University of Vienna either. And uh, then he went home and did his writing, I guess. He never talked about the book, a book he was working on until it was out. And um, the one that made the big impression on the Viennese of that day was the book Socialism that came out in 1922, which was influential with Hayek especially. He's mentioned it and attributed much of his uh, education to that and his understanding. And he kept on working and writing, finally in 1934. Uh, he, he left Vienna because he knew the Nazis were likely to take over and that it wouldn't be too good for Jews. He went to Geneva, Switzerland. His, he was back in Geneva, I mean in Vienna, in February 38 to make arrangements to get married and then left and it was, Hitler came in in, 19, in March 38 and he didn't go back. His wife, future wife came and joined him and they were married in Geneva. Came to this country in 1940, started teaching at NYU in a lecture course in 45 and the seminar in 48. I went there from 1951 until he uh, retired in 1969 at the age of 89. So I have all these notes. I've read you some of the highlights, but uh, as I was reading them over, they were, I, I, I found them fascinating again, and I hope when I finish my other projects, <laughs> I can get to them. I have a few handouts here, and um, if you'd like to pass them out. Now they're not, uh, I brought only, I did an article about Mises Seminar uh, in, uh, I don't know what it is, 81? Yes, 81, it's 100th anniversary. I only have 10 copies of that. But I brought also another article, a uh, very short thing. I have it on a tape and if I'd known we were going to be here, I could have a cassette tape, audio. I would, but you, I was told the place was so noisy that I knew you wouldn't be able to hear it. But this, we did uh, transcribe it and we printed it in the Freeman. And it's just a short piece, but it's an excellent piece, I think. I'll keep, uh, you have, at least you have enough for a while. Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. 
Why don't I keep a copy of the other one, and if anybody wants to just contact my office, and I'll... Uh, you can run off copies, yeah. Run off copy and send it to you. Uh -huh. Well, uh, that wasn't very well organized. That's great. <laughs> Uh, what about Rand? Uh, what? Ayn Rand? Oh yes, um, he did. He has one famous quote about Ayn. Now some of these quotes you'll find other places, and I know where if you read in this book you can find out just where they appeared. But um, he did say, he read Ayn Rand's uh, Atlas Shrugged, and I guess he read The Fountainhead, I don't know. But he was impressed by what she wrote about the bureaucrats. He said nobody's writing about the bureaucrats like that in Atlas Shrugged, and he said, you have to say she's one of the best, greatest men of the century. <laughs> uh, they did get into a big scrap, though, and that also has been written up. And I've had stories, I've had it from Hazlitt and other people. Hazlitt, the Hazlitts invited Ayn Rand and her husband, Frank O'Connor, and the Mises, Mr. and Mrs. Mises, Professor and Mrs. Mises, down to their apartment in Washington Square in New York, in Manhattan, one evening. And, um, uh, Hazlitt, I mean uh, Mises and Ayn Rand got into a big argument. Nobody knows what they were arguing about. I can have my ideas. I suspect, um, well, it could have been as, as Ayn Rand says, uh, values that, that which Mises says are subjective and of course she has an objective basis for her values and she thinks this is, uh, anyway, I, I don't know what it was about. But they got into a big scrap and Hazlitt, I mean, no, just the two of them together, and Hazlitt came into the room where they were arguing and um, Ayn Rand said, he thinks I'm just nothing but a stupid little Jew girl. And Hazlitt said, I'm sure Lou didn't mean it. And, Hazlitt, and Mises said, I meant exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so as I think it's Barbara Brandon says that uh, Mrs. Mises finally got them to make friends again. But no, it was after that that he said, made her remark about her being one of the great men of the century. So um, he gave her a lot of credit. But um, uh, you know, everybody in this world has to fight in their own way. She fought with novels. He couldn't write a novel if he tried to. And uh, Hazlitt wrote in his way, a uh, different way. Hayek, something else. And uh, I would have to say Friedman in another way. And Rothbard in still another way. Everybody, uh, we had a man at the office uh, in the foundation once who was an excellent speaker. Unfortunately, he died. But he said, I think of it as a great big mountain of truth. And everybody's tapping around at a different angle trying to get at this truth and we all are getting little pieces of this truth from this mountain but we aren't we each use our own different method we each, but we're aiming at the same thing and I think in some ways that's what all these people are doing Bumper in his way Michael in his way everybody's trying to get at the truth and trying to promote the truth and express the truth as best they can Mises had his way, and there were people who didn't understand his way and didn't understand him. And I suppose that's the fate of anybody who's saying anything that's significant. Some people understand and other people don't, and they can't do anything about it except to express the truth as they see it in their way. <laughs>